All right, we're starting our second installment this morning in, uh, in a little study we're doing for about four or five weeks on how to uncork your Bible. And we started last Sunday morning, and we were just laying down some very easy things to understand. And the first thing that we talked about last Sunday morning that we need, we need to draw on seriously uh, if we're, if we're going to uncork our Bible. And I think, there, I think there is such a wealth of understanding and knowledge in here in Revelation that we haven't tapped into because we don't understand some very fundamental principles about how to, how to understand what's being written here. And so if, you, um, if the Bible to you has been a, a, a book that kind of puzzles you or confuses you or you've never really gotten a lot out of it, uh, I think you're, you're going to value from this as we go through over the next two or three weeks. We started very, very fundamentally last week and we said the first thing you need to understand when you, when you, when you approach your Bible, it, when you open it up, you'll notice that there are, are two covenants. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. How many, how many already knew that? I know you did because there's like this white page in there that says old and new, right? The Old Testament and the New Testament are addressed to two separate groups of people for two separate reasons. So we have two covenants. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was directed specifically to the children of Israel and it contained a covenant of law. The New Testament is directed to all the nations and it is packed full of a revelation of grace. So when you're reading, when you're reading your Bible, you need, you need to draw a sharp distinction and you need to understand whether you're reading an old covenant that is addressed to the children of Israel or you're reading the New Testament, the new covenant that is directed to all the nations on the earth. That was the first, first thing you want to always ask yourself which covenant am I reading here? And keep in mind, they're addressed to two separate groups of people. Now I want to deal with the second question this morning. We'll probably get through five over five weeks. Second question, when you sit down and read your Bible, the second thing you want to ask yourself is this. Are you talking to me? You got it? Are you talking to me? Always remember that the entire Bible is written for you. But not all of the Bible is written to you. Let me, let me, let me, let me run that by you again. I want you to always remember all of the Bible is written for you, but not all of the Bible is written to you. <clears throat> Paul gives us a, a clarification on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I apologize for all the scripture this morning. I think I, I got about 18 different scriptures we're going to turn to, but sometimes the scripture just says it better than I can. So we're going to read a lot, of, a lot of Bible this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul draws this clarification on how all scripture may be for you, but not all the Bible is to you. All, all the scripture, whenever you read in the Old Testament, and that's what I'm referring to specifically this morning, there's a lot that you can pull out of the Old Testament that is, that is good knowledge, it's wisdom, uh, you may get some revelation from it, receive insight, but the Old Testament was not written specifically to you, it was written to the children of Israel. Now it doesn't mean it can't be for you, but it's not really to you. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, speaking about the Old Testament, and I'm going to read pretty much out of the NLT again this morning. In verse 11, he says, These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So he says in the very first part of the verse, These things happened to them as an example for us. <clears throat> Let me give you just a little key here. Uh, something I learned a long time ago, one of the few things I retained from, from school that help you understand the distinction and drawing a line in the Old Covenants. And if, if when you read the Bible you ask yourself, are you talking to me? All right, just jot this down. In the old, the new is concealed. And in the new, the old is revealed. Can I say that again? In the old, the new is concealed. The new is in the old, but it's just very concealed. But in the new, the old is revealed. 
If you want to know the depth in what the old is all about, you have to look at it through the eyes of the New Testament. So when you sit down and, and you read especially the Old Covenant, you need to look at the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, through the lens of the New Covenant. For example, let's read Deuteronomy chapter 28. This, this is a good one. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let me read verses 1 and 2. The Old Covenant called on people. The Old Testament was all about people doing their part. And when the people did their part, then God would do His part. But if the people didn't do their part, then God did not do His part. So God always, in the Old Covenant, God was always reacting to the initiation of the people based on their obedience and, and their ability to, to do what He told them to do. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1, it says this, If you fully obey the Lord your God, and carefully keep all His commandments that I'm giving you today, then the Lord God will set you on high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Now do you see in that passage of Scripture in the Old, God is, Moses is saying, guys look, for God to bless you, you got to obey. And not just obey, you have to obey everything, all of His commandments. Now, if, if that is speaking to you, you're in a heap of trouble. You're in a lot of trouble this morning. Because He says you must fully obey the Lord your God, keep all His commandments, and then the Lord will set you on high. He will bless you if you obey the Lord your God. So I want you, here's what I want you to see on this. You obey, then God blesses. If you don't obey, then God doesn't bless. If the old, if in the Old Testament, if the people were negligent or they were rebellious or for whatever reason they did not carry through on their end of the bargain, they failed on their side, then God did not keep His side. And in verse 15 of the same chapter... It says this, If you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and all the decrees that I'm giving you today, then all these curses will come on you and they will overwhelm you. Now again, if, that is speaking, if, that, if that's speaking to you, you're in a heap of trouble this morning. When you, when you read the scripture, it's important to ask, Are you talking to me? It can well be addressed to the people of that covenant and not you. Now we can learn from their experience. There's wisdom, there's revelation, there's insight. But it's not written to you. The new covenant is not a covenant. The new covenant is not a covenant of you do your part, then God does His part. There's a line of distinction there. Old covenant, you obey, you do all that God says, then God reacts to your obedience. The new covenant is not a covenant of you do your part, God does His part. And that, that is a carryover of understanding from the old covenant. And because we have that mentality, and we've kind of been trained with that mentality in the church, when we come to the new covenant, we read the new covenant through the eyes of the old covenant, and we're looking for what I have to do for God to bless me. For what I have to do for God to pour out His favor on me. And that is not how the new, new Covenant reads. That is a huge misunderstanding that has confused and affected multitudes of people today. It affects, when you, when you read the Bible and you see, okay, I have to do my part, then God does His part. It affects how you read the Bible. It affects how you see God. It affects what, what you believe. It affects how you believe. When you read scripture and you say, okay, this is talking to me. I have to do my part and then God will do his part. What it does, it creates a works mentality in us that drives deep within us that if I don't do, then God won't respond. Now the truth is this. You have absolutely no part in the new covenant. If Jesus spoke the truth when Jesus hung on the cross... And he said, it is 
finished, then not only did He fulfill His part, He fulfilled your part. So all that's left for us to do is to celebrate and give Him thanks that He has finished His part and finished our part. So when you come, when you, when you then read something like Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1, you read it through the eyes of, of the new covenant, you begin to read it through the eyes of grace and you would say this, you would read it like this. <clears throat> You'd say, <clears throat> if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all His commands that I'm giving you today, then the Lord God will set you high above the nations of the world. You'll experience blessings if you obey all that the Lord your God says for you to do. Now what you'll do is you'll look at that through the eyes of grace and you'll say, thank God that Jesus was my obedience. That Jesus fulfilled my part of obeying. He's, he kept every command. He kept every law. He kept everything that He needed to keep. And He did it not just for you, He did it as you. So when you come and you read a verse like Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, you can say, thank you, Jesus, that you are my obedience. Therefore, God will respond. It's not based on my response. Now, so then that brings the how is the how is the old like the new? Frankly, it isn't. What, what is the common ground of of the Old Testament with the New Testament? There is absolutely none. They are two different covenants, two different groups of people speaking to us in two different ways. So when you sit down and read your Bible, you need to ask yourself, are you talking to me? And when you read Deuteronomy 28.1, it may be for you, but it's not speaking directly to you and you begin to look at it then through the eyes of the new covenant, and then it will talk to you. There is no common ground between old and new. There is no common denominator, no thread. Now, I, I will tell you that in the old, the new is concealed. In the new, the old is revealed. But they're two different covenants, and they speak to us in two different ways. So much so, we read this last week. Let's read again Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. This is a hard thing for us to dismiss that the old covenant does not have jurisdiction nor does it have a rule or a say over the people of God today. So, so much so that in Romans 8, chap, the 8th chapter and the 13th verse, the last verse of, of that 8th chapter of Romans, it says, when God speaks of a new covenant... It means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. Let me just tell you straight. There is no old covenant anymore. It's gone for Jew and Gentile both alike. Am I saying don't read it? No, I'm not saying don't read it. You should read it. I'm saying you should learn from it, you should gain wisdom from it, but listen to me, it is not a binding contract. You're under a superior covenant. The new covenant is what the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, has already accomplished for you. The old covenant is what part we must play, what part we must do, to make God happy and pleased and bless us. Vast difference. All right? Now, you would think by this time in history, we would have learned, we would have at least proven, or we would have looked at the example as we read earlier, uh, where Paul said that what they did was left as an example for us. You would think that we would look at the example of those in the Old Covenant and see that they could never keep it that they could never fulfill it, that they could never please God by their actions, that they could never please God by their obedience. If, if pleasing God was based on obedience, man was totally lost. So the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, did for us what we can't do ourselves, which is to act as our, on our behalf as our obedience. So when we look at the New Covenant, we see what the Father through the Son and the Spirit has already accomplished for us. 
The new covenant is not like the one that God made with Israel. Aren't you glad this morning? The new covenant was made between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you and I had no part in making it. You and I had no part in keeping it. And we had no part in executing it. Every time the covenant, the new covenant was made between the Father and the Son. Remember, every time we take communion, we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 or verse like that, where Jesus said, here, take the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant. And it's my blood, Jesus is saying. It was his blood that, that, that instituted the new covenant. It was not your doing or my doing. We had nothing to do with making it, administrating it, keeping it, or executing it. What we have in the new covenant is an inheritance. And the inheritance that you and I have is an inclusion in what they fulfilled together, what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit fulfilled together in the new covenant, you and I can enjoy this morning as an inheritance. The only part we have in the new covenant is in Christ. Christ made the covenant and we are in Him. But really, you and I have an inheritance. An inheritance is money, goods, or services that you receive on the death of another person. The other person that died giving us our inheritance was Jesus. And so I want you to begin to think inheritance, inheritance, inheritance. Because there's nothing you do for an inheritance. The lawyer calls and says, Uncle Fred died, you need to be at my office, we're going to read the will. You have no idea. You didn't do anything for it. You show up and, and the lawyer says, Uncle Fred left you this and this and this. And you go, wow, hallelujah. Thank you, Uncle Fred. And that should be the way you approach the New, New Testament. You see everything that Jesus died to give us and your response should be, wow, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's nothing I did to earn it. Nothing I did to merit. Nothing I did to, to draw it to me. He left it for me. Now we're going to go bing, 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 bing. Four quick scriptures on inheritance. And I want you to see inheritance in the scripture. And I, don't, I, I didn't do a lot of research, so you may call me on it. But I don't know of any place in the New Testament where it says that you have a, a freestanding uh, covenant with God yourself. I think all of the new covenant is based on the Father and the Son. And you and I then have inheritance. And we're included in the covenant through Christ. Now I want you to start thinking inheritance. Look, Ephesians chapter 1. Let's read off just a few, few quick verses this morning. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. It says, Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance for God, from God. For He chose us in advance... And he makes everything work out according to his plan. Because we're united with Christ, we have an inheritance. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. All right, come down to verse, come down to verse 14. The, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He, he did this so we would praise and glorify him. That's just so good. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised. And that he has purchased, to help, purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. All right, now verse 18, same chapter. Verse 18, same chapter. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. You're, you, did you know you're God's inheritance? Even God has an inheritance. It's you. You have an inheritance. Your inheritance, let me make it real easy. Here's your inheritance. Your inheritance is Christ. Everything that he is, you have inherited. Everything that he purchased, everything that he bought, everything that he, he got through, through his death, his burial, his resurrection, 
Everything that, has, that he has purchased is not, is not only just yours, he is yours. He's your inheritance this morning. Let's read, read a couple of more. Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, over to the right. Colossians. <clears throat> let's, let's try chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 says, Always thanking the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. Chapter 3, verse 24. Chapter 3, verse 24. Colossians chapter 3, verse 24. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. And that the master you are serving is Christ. One more. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. And verse 4 says, and we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. So what you, you have an inheritance. That means this morning that you are an heir. An heir has an inheritance. Um, what, what is it? What we, we, we did it in school. Is it Galatians chapter 4? I think it's chapter 4, 7. Galatians 4, 7. Let me read it out of the uh, NLT, then I want to read it out of, the, uh, out of the mirror. NLT says this. Now you're no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. All right, let's read it out of the mirror. The mirror says this. Can you see how foolish it would be for a son to continue to live, live his life with a slave mentality? Your sonship qualifies you to immediately participate in all the wealth of God's inheritance, which is yours because of Christ. So what's left for you to do? God has given you this inheritance. What is left for you to do? All that's left for you to do is to say, Father, thank you for the inheritance. The whole inheritance comes to you by grace. It's unmerited. It's unearned. It comes to you simply because God has, God has changed in His approach in how He deals with people. In the Old Covenant, you had to obey, you had to do, you had to fulfill the law, and then God responded to your obedience with blessing. Now when we come to the New Covenant, God begins to bless you with an inheritance before you do anything. And the only thing we can do is say thank you. So if you've never said thank you for your inheritance, just give them a thank you this morning. Do you know that could be the biggest, that could be the biggest tool of evangelism that we have never used in the church? Have you ever heard anybody address a group of unbelievers and tell them what their inheritance is? To tell a group of unbelievers, look what, look what he has provided for you. Let me tell you what, what you have today because of what Christ did. Not because of your obedience or what, what you're going to do, but because of what he has freely given to you. Have you ever heard, heard anybody say to a group of unbelievers that in the Old Testament God gave you an invoice for your sins? You owe. But in the New Testament, he doesn't give you an invoice. He gives you a receipt that is marked paid in full by the blood of Jesus. I have to tell you this morning, God's never going to give you an invoice for sin. He only gives you a receipt. So these, the covenants, the old covenant, the new covenant, have contrasting voices. When you read the Bible, you need to ask, are you talking to me? Right? You got Old Testament, you got New Testament. Then you need to say, are you talking 
to me. Jesus talked about this. Jesus talked about contrasting voices and listening to one voice and not listening to another in that, in that famous chapter in John chapter 10. So I want to pick some things out of John chapter 10. You know, that's the one where Jesus said the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy, but I've come that you might have life. Let's look at that just a little bit deeper this morning, and let's look, look at it in terms of, of listening to a voice, asking, are you talking to me? John chapter 10 and verse 1. I'm gonna, uh, let me read first six verses, and then uh, we'll read verse 10 and, and 16. John chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a, of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. All right, so he tells us right up front who the thief is. The thief is somebody that goes into the sheepfold other than going through the gate. Later on, Jesus tells us he's the gate. So anybody that thinks they have access except through Christ is a thief and a robber, right? But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice. The sheep recognize his voice. The sheep recognize his voice. When the sheep hear the voice of the shepherd and they say, are you talking to me? The sheep say, yes. You know the voice of the shepherd this morning. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has, has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him. Watch, because they know his voice. So when you read the words of spirit and life and you say, are you talking to me? You'll know he's talking to you because you know his voice. Verse 5, they won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Verse 6, those who heard Jesus use these illustrations didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. Now let me just read verse, verse 10. This is the one. The thief the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and to destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Verse 16. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Now the, the key to understanding what Jesus is saying here is who is he talking to in this 10th chapter? When we just read a whole string of scriptures that Jesus talked about gates and shepherds and sheep and hearing voices and not hearing voices, the question is, who's, who's Jesus addressing this to? If you come back to chapter 9, verse 40, you'll see that he's making a little uh, discourse to the Pharisees. In chapter 9, verse 40, it says, Some of the Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? So Jesus then goes into this discourse that carries over through this, this 10th chapter of John and he begins, so really he's talking to the Pharisees. So we've got, I want to submit something to you this morning. I want to submit to you that the thief is not the devil. Amen. That's what we've learned always. The thief comes to kill, to kill, to kill steal, and to destroy. Okay, I'll, I'll grant you that might, that might be what the, the carnal mind the devil does, but let me just say, I don't think John 10.10 10 has anything to do with the devil. I think what Jesus is talking about are two sets of voices in two groups of people here. He's talking about the voice of the Pharisee, which is the voice of law, and he's talking about his voice, the good shepherd's voice, which is the voice of grace. I want you to think this morning or ponder or meditate that perhaps the thief that he's talking about here is the voice of the Pharisee or the voice of law because it gives no life. The voice of Jesus is the voice of the shepherd. It's the voice of grace and it does give life. And the voice of the shepherd, the voice of Jesus, gives voice to every sheep. He says in verse 11, in verse 11 of that, of that chapter, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. The sheep hear the voice of the good shepherd. The sheep hear the voice of grace. But the sheep do not hear and they do not follow the voice of law. Verse 4 and 5. Let's, let's read that again. Verse 4. And he has... After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him 
because they know his voice. You know the voice of Jesus this morning. When he speaks to you, you know his voice and you follow him. But he says in verse 5 that the voice of a stranger, and he's speaking to Pharisees here. He's speaking to Pharisees that are, are entrenched in law. And in verse 5, he says they don't follow strangers. They run from strangers because they don't know their voice. They hear the voice of grace. When you, when you read what Jesus said, when you read the new covenant, and you, and you say, are you talking to me? You know he's talking to you. But when you come to other parts that aren't consistent with what he has said, you'll say it may be for me, but it's not to me. I might can get something out of that. There might be some wisdom. There might be something I can pull out of that. But it's not being directed to me absolutely. So when the voice of law is confronted by the voice of grace, it always reacts the same way. And we read that in verse, verse 19 and verse 20. Let's read that. When grace confronts law, when the voice of grace confronts the voice of law, it always reacts the same way. And here it is in verse 19. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinions about Jesus. Some said, he's demon-possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? Verse 21, others said, this man doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And I'm not, I'm going to suggest he's not just talking about physically blind. Can a man possessed with a demon open the spiritual eyes of a spiritually blind person? Absolutely not. But anytime that law, anytime grace confronts law, there's always a resistance to it. Because law is looking, law is hearing a voice that says, you must do in order to be, you must do in order to have, you must do in order to achieve. But when the voice of grace comes, it's the voice that the shepherd has laid his life down for the sheep. The sheep did nothing. What did you ever do to get the shepherd to lay his life down for you? Nothing. He did it because he wanted to, right? Now here are some voices that you're going to hear between the two covenants, and you're going to have to make a determination on which one is for you. Are you talking to me? Let me read, let me read two or three old and new covenant. And I want to show you the contrast. Then you've got to make a distinction. When you're reading Scripture, if it's directed towards you, if the voice is, is speaking to you or not. For example, Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. We're, gonna, we're just going to have to knock these off real quick this morning. And I'm, I'm trying to draw some contrast today between two different voices in two different covenants to get you accustomed to hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd, the voice of the covenant of His grace. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, it says this. Isaiah says, It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because your sins have turned away, because, your, because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Now, is that voice to me? Now, if that voice is to me, I can understand how in church we came up with the idea that sin separates us from God. When you read a verse like that, how can you not feel that our sins have separated us. Anytime I sin, God turns his face. He doesn't listen anymore. I'm totally separated from God. I'm in a mess. If that is to you, then I understand, I understand your dilemma this morning. Why you, don't feel, why you don't feel close to God. Why you have to sing songs of, come closer, Lord Jesus. I, I hunger for your presence. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're far away from me. Come fill this room. I understand why you feel that way is because you feel that, that there is something going on in your life that he's not happy with, he's turned from, he's not hearing you anymore, and it's based on what you do or what you haven't done. Now let's contrast that with Romans chapter 8. Let's come over to the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. And let me read uh, verses 35 to 39. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. It says, can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scripture says, for your sakes we are, are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, 
overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, our, through Christ who loves us. And he says in verse 38, And I am convinced that nothing... Now you just need to listen to this. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Isaiah said, sin separates. Paul said, nothing separates. Now, you have to ask yourself, who's talking to me here? Who's talking to me? In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, this is, this is, this is one, if you've been in church any length of time, you've, you've read this one. Jeremiah chapter 17 and, and verse 9. It says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad this heart of a man really is? Now let's go over and read uh, Romans chapter 6. Is he speaking to me there? Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 says, Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly or from the heart obey his teachings we have given you. So, Paul said, well, let me just read this out of the mirror. Let me read this out of the mirror, because this is good out of the mirror. The content of teaching that your heart embraced has set a new standard to become the pattern for your life. The grace of God ended sin's dominance. Now hold that right there. Watch. The content of teaching that your heart embraced. So what's Paul saying here? Paul said our heart is the motivator for obedience. Jeremiah said, your heart is desperately wicked. Now you've got to make it determined. Who's talking to me here? Is Jeremiah telling me my heart is desperately wicked, no man can know how bad it is, how messed up it is? Or is Paul talking to me when he says that my heart is the motivator for my obedience? Then you remember we read last week where Ezekiel, in looking forward, God said, I'll give you a new heart. Take out the heart of stone, put a heart of flesh in there. I'll put my spirit in with you, give you a brand new heart. So who's right? Isaiah that said, sin separates us from God. Paul that said, nothing can separate us from God. Jeremiah that said, our heart is evil. Or Paul that said, our heart is a great motivator toward obedience. Who's right? They're all right. They're speaking to different people under different covenants. But can you begin to see how squirreled up we have become by not discerning and separating covenants? Not separating the old from the new. And so when we come to church, we hear so many messages where somebody pulls a verse out of the new and then they pull a verse out of the old. Or we pull a verse out of the old that makes our heart look desperately wicked. Who can trust it? Then we come over to the New Testament and we read something that's absolutely contrary, different, throws another light on it, and we go, whoa. And we wonder why people are confused. We wonder why people don't read their Bibles, why they get nothing out of their Bibles. It's because we haven't drawn, question last week, which covenant are you reading? And we haven't taken it down another level. Are you talking to me? We need to listen and read with our gray eyes. Is this to me or is this for me? It makes a huge difference. Listen, when you see something is for you and you can learn from it and you get wisdom from it, yes, the heart, some hearts, you know what, are pretty desperate. They're, they may be well evil. And there's some wisdom I can get out of dealing with people and understanding what you're dealing with. But that is not, 
the basic teaching of the new covenant. It makes a huge difference when you read your Bible. It makes a tremendous difference in what you believe. It makes a difference in how you see God and how you see other people. It is impossible, body of Christ, to try to obey the voice of the old covenant and the new covenant at the same time. You cannot do it. If you listen to the voice of the old, it will confuse you and, it, and you'll not get out of the new what you need to get out of the new. Now here, I'm going I'm to give you one I've taught many times. And my mind was blown this couple of days ago because David Carter, one of the guys that spoke, used to be a, our youth pastor here. And he remembered when I taught this scripture. And I went, oh man. Because I taught it, I'm going to read it for you because it's one everybody, we, I'll tell you, I could, I could get some prayer meetings together on this verse. This was a prayer meeting gathering verse. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. Now look at this. You got 1 Chronicles, brother. There's a whole, lot, whole world of difference. Did I write 1 Chronicles? I may have written 1 Chronicles. All right, then I'll just read it out of my Bible. Once I start it, you're all going to know it. Right? How many know it before I even get there? You've heard it so many times. He's got it. Then if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and restore their land. Now what God is saying is this. God is saying, I will bless you if you do this first. If you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek my face, if you turn from your wicked ways, do all of that first. Then I'll forgive your sins and restore your land. Do you see any works mentality in that? Now I'm telling you, you can, you can almost every citywide prayer gathering that you'll ever attend, that is the verse. The old covenant is always a two-sided proposition. You do this, and, and God will respond. All right? The old covenant is two sides. It's a proposition. And this verse says it so well. You humble yourself, you pray, seek his face, turn from your wicked ways. You'll hear from heaven, then you'll hear from heaven. You won't hear from heaven until. And so you always wonder, am I, am, have I turned from all of my wicked ways? I'm not hearing from heaven. I don't know how many citywide prayer gatherings I've been to, and honestly, nothing really changes a whole lot. So I have to say, well, did I turn from my wicked ways? Did I seek his face hard enough? Did I humble myself enough? Did I pray long enough? What, where did I miss it? Because God said, surely if I do those things, that I will hear from heaven. So if I haven't heard from heaven, it must be the onus is on me because I haven't, I haven't done enough. So let's, let's gather again and let's, let's cry and wail and let's, let's plead and beg God some more to do for us and to come and maybe he'll show us where we're missing it here so that because we do want him to forgive our sins and restore our lands. This verse will make you a God chaser. Tommy Tenney wrote a book called God Chasers. This, this will make you chase God. Now Paul said, you know, is that talking to you? Is that talking, don't answer me, just is that, is that to or is it for you? There, there might be something in there that's of value, but is that actually talking to you? Is God saying, look, you got to do this and this and this and this and this, and if you don't do it perfect, you won't hear from me, I won't forgive your sin, and I won't heal your land. And there are multitudes of Christian people today that believe that God is not working in our country enough because we're not doing all of those things. And I see it all the time. Now here's what Paul said. Paul said in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. 
Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Now let me, let, me read this, let me read this out of the mirror. The same verse out of the mirror. You don't have it? Okay. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Listen to this. Do not underestimate God's kindness. The wealth of His benevolence and His and his resolute refusal to let go of us is his patient passion is to shepherd everyone into a radical mind shift. The New King James says, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So now watch. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, the voice of the Old Testament says, if you repent, then God will show you his kindness. Now watch the shift. The voice of the New Testament, the voice of grace says, God shows you kindness. And because of this overwhelming flood of kindness and love and mercy, you will repent. Now you have to ask yourself, who's talking to you? Who's talking to you? Does God want us to humble ourselves, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways? Yes. Does he want to forgive our sin? He already has, but yes. Does he want to heal our land? Yes. But it comes as the result of a revelation of the kindness that God has toward all of us, each and every one of us, and I'm telling you, the reason we're, we're not seeing the humility and the repentance and the things that 2 Chronicles 7.14 said we had to do first to see the favor and the blessing of God is because we don't have a revelation of the favor and the goodness and the blessing of God which brings a effortless, natural response of humility, repentance, and turning from sin. Dear Jesus, if we could just see how good God is, how kind He is, that He's not standing back offish with His arms folded, waiting for you to grovel and beg and gather together and plead for Him to do something. He knows that when you see how good that He really is, and when you know that He's talking to you through His grace and His love, there's going to be a response that comes from you of repentance. That's exactly what Paul said. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So rather than telling our world how wicked they are, how lost they are, how undone they are, in an effort to get them to repent, how about if we begin to give a revelation and a disclosure of how good He is and how, what His kindness is about and how His love overflows, knowing that based on what I feel God says to me, are you talking to me? Yes, you're talking to me. When I see your kindness, your goodness, then I will repent. There's only one voice to you. It's the voice of the New Testament. When you know which covenant is speaking to you today, it gives you a right mind. It gives you a right outlook on a lot of things. It'll change the way you see God, first of all. It'll change the way you see yourself. It'll change your identity. Are you speaking to me? Covenant of law, covenant of grace. What you read in the scripture may be for you with value, insight, but it might not be directly given to you. Now don't leave church today saying, Pastor said we don't have to humble ourselves and pray. And, no, listen. I'm saying the, the motivation that brings us there is different. We don't do those things to get God's favor. God pours His favor on us and as a result of His favor, those things happen. Because we haven't emphasized His favor enough yet to where people get it and see it and, are, and, and light up at how 
how awesome God really is, we still use a crowbar to get him to repent. We use manipulation and control and fear. That if you don't repent, brother, I'm going to tell you something now, right now. God's going to be after you. They just don't know my father. Understanding if scripture is talking to you or not is, is an immeasurable benefit in helping you to uncork this thing and help you to apply it to its intended use. You see, through Christ we have a covenant. We don't have a contract. A contract's a 50-50 thing. 2 Chronicles 7.14 is like a contract. You do your part, God does His part. You know, if you're a builder, I hire you. You build, I pay. But you don't build, I don't pay. You and I have an agreement, we shake hands, we have a contract. You don't do your part, I don't do my part. A covenant is different. A covenant is two people making a bilateral agreement, listen, with a unilateral commitment. Covenant is binding even if the one does not hold up his side, his end, the other person, because it's a unilateral commitment, still is obligated to hold up his. Covenant says, if you don't do your part, I still do my part. That's why we read something like 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. This is covenant. This is grace covenant right here. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13 says, If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny who he is. Folks, you'll never read a verse like that in the Old Covenant. You'll never read a verse like that. Is that, is that speaking to me? You bet it's speaking to me. That talks to me volumes. You'll never read that in the Old Covenant. Because the Old Covenant is, you're faithful, then God is faithful. You obey, God responds. We come to this and it says, even if you're unfaithful, he remains faithful. That's what covenant of grace, that's what a covenant that talks to you looks like. That says that God gives you 100% of what you don't earn. That verse says God gives you 100% of what you don't merit. Why? Because you have an inheritance. He made covenant with the Son to include you. And so, because you're included in the Son... The son's obedience is your obedience. I saw a girl on one Wednesday night when we first got started. That hit her like a ton of bricks. She never realized that she didn't have to stand in her obedience. That she is obedient with the obedience of Jesus. Jesus is your obedience this morning. Jesus is your righteousness this morning. His life is your life. Jesus didn't live for you. Can I just topple that over this morning? Jesus is not your example. Jesus didn't live for you. Jesus lives as you. In the eyes of the Father, Jesus lives as you. Now, yes, he's a good example. You, that's for you, okay? Just take it. It's, good. it's all right. But he lives as you, as he is. So are we in this present world. As He is. He is your life. you got to start seeing that He is your life. Are you talking to me? If what you read, listen, I'm done. If what you read, if what you read tells you how much you are like Jesus, you're perfect, you're holy, you're righteous, you're redeemed, you're justified, you're reconciled, you're accepted, yeah, it's talking to you. If what you're reading tells you how much you have to do yet to be like Jesus, it's not talking to you directly. It might be for you, but it's not talking to you. When he talks to you, he will talk to you out of new covenant and it will come by grace it will come through favor that you haven't earned or merited in any way, shape, or form. So when you pick up your Bible this week, I want you to just ask two questions so far. Which covenant am I in? Who, who's this talking to? And the second question I want you to ask yourself is, is this talking to me? 
Or is this for me? Amen? Amen. Let's just bow our heads.